Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone and Family Partnership Council members. Today is June 18th, and thank you all for joining us for our meeting. And so I just want to say a few things. I want to thank you all so much for all of the topics that you sent in that helped us frame up today's meeting. It really does help us to make this meeting um, very purposeful and meaningful for you all and for um, for us as a council. And so I do want to say thank you for your interactive and engaging questions at our March meeting. It made for a great conversation. I think it really helped us as we move forward in some of the work. So I'm really looking forward to that again today. And so I'd just like to say, hope everyone is staying nice and cool on a hot day and just introduce myself again. I am Marcia Van Hook, the full service community schools manager. I work in the division of school and program improvement in the office of continuous improvement and support at KDE. And I serve as your council chair. So I would like to, I do need to uh, share a couple of things before we get started. I just wanna remind you of our purpose for the family partnership council. The council serves in an advisory role to the Kentucky Department of Education and provides input regarding topics of interest to families, such as ways that families and communities can assist schools in ensuring that the achievement level of all students is increased. And I just like to read that verbatim so I don't miss any of those important words. And then advisory councils, this just serves as a reminder, please ensure that your video is streaming and that you are visible during the duration of this meeting. Your microphone should be muted when you are not speaking. Just however, all discussions are recorded and must be made available to the public. So just make certain that your mic is unmuted when speaking. And so without further ado, we're gonna move on into our meeting and I'm going to turn it on over to Leslie for roll call. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, Marsha Van Hook. Here. Laura Beard. Laura Beard. I thought I said I'm here. Here. Okay, good. Thank you. Brittany Faulkner. I'm here. Great. Elizabeth Bruce. Here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Tara Tupper. Here. Leah Markham. Here. Amy Nickerson. Here. Alicia Miller. Amity Kukla. Melissa Gowan. Amity Kukla's here, sorry. No problem. Uh, Melissa Gowans. I think she's- Stephanie um, Mark. Hmm? No, Melissa won't, won't be with us today. She had told me that, yes. yes. Um, Stephanie Barker. Here. Uh, Rhonda Logsdon. Here. Hope y'all are doing good. Thank you. Erin Weaver. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Chris Medley. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I'm going to turn this back over to Chairman Van Hook. Thank you, Leslie. Um, we're going to move on into the March minutes. I just want to remind you they were sent to you as an attachment in this calendar invite. So hopefully you've had a chance to look over those. I think Leslie has dropped them in the chat box or will be uh, just in case you need to review or think about them for a moment. So I'm give you just a minute and then I will be asking for a motion to approve. And there they are. Emily put them in. Thank you, Emily. I'll give you just a minute to look at those. Does anyone need more time? I see some folks just reading. OK, I think everybody's ready. Um, then I'm going to go ahead and call for a motion to approve the March meeting minutes. 
I so move, Erin Weaver. Thank you, and may I have a second? I'll second Brittany Faulkner. Thank you, and then all in favor? Thanks for the raised hands. Um, any opposed? All right, thank you. Motion removed. Uh, during this portion of our meeting, we usually have reserved a spot for the commissioner to speak. I just wanted to share that Commissioner Kenny is preparing for an all KDE team meeting that's actually happening this afternoon at the same time. So she is working really hard to type some loose ends and just preparing for that transition as Dr. Robert Fletcher will be moving into his next role as Kentucky's next commissioner of education officially on July 1. So she won't be joining us today, but she did send her apologies for not being able to meet with us. And so I do want to say to you, thank you again for your topics. Um, I'm going to, as our presenters are sharing this afternoon, I'm going to monitor the chat. And I know Leslie will help me as well and Emily um, for questions that you may have. I know each of the presenters have also reserved some time in their presentation for your comments and questions, but feel free with your questions, raise your hand. We'll get to you and do the best we can. If we miss you, don't, don't be afraid to come off the mic and ask your question. So without further ado, we are going to move into our first presenter for today. And that is Matthew Courtney. I think I saw him online. Let's make sure he's here. And Hi, Marcia, I'm here. Hey, thanks, Matthew. I, I couldn't see you in my screen. So Matthew is, he will not have prepared slides for us today. So I don't want you to panic when I'm not uh, speeding through some slides, but he is going to speak to us and, and provide us with that legislative update. So Matthew, the floor is yours. All right, thanks so much, Marsha, um, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here today to talk a little bit about legislation. Um, Marsha is correct, I did not prepare slides for you today, um, and that is simply because um, I don't like for there to be multiple versions of uh, what we're saying about legislation floating around. And so what I've done instead is I've put in the link um, I mean, in the chat, a link to our official guidance document that lays out KDE's guidance for all of the education related regulation uh, statutes that have changed um, throughout the session. So I would ask you to refer to that document um, in lieu of slides today. That way we just always have one um, consistent message on some of these thorny issues. And um, what I'm going to do for the, over the next couple of minutes, I've pulled out just a handful of bills that I think are um, of most relevance to the Family and Partnership Council and the work that you do. And then, of course, I'll be happy to address um, any additional questions or any bills that maybe you've heard about and you're wondering about um, that I didn't talk about here today. So first, I want to start with the 2024 to 2026 budget. This is House Bill 6, um, and this is where the legislature spells out all of their funding and efforts um, to fund our public schools in the coming year. Um, this was a pretty good year for education funding, and um, we did receive um, some increases in funding that are going to be very helpful to our schools and districts. A couple of things um, to note out of the budget. Um, there are some new reporting requirements in the budget this year that's a little strange um, that go in addition and beyond our state accountability system. So in addition to our regular accountability system that I know you've had presentations on before in the past where schools will get colors and there's the different indicators and all of that, um, schools are now going to be required to post um, the per district's percentage of students scoring proficient and distinguished in reading and proficient and distinguished in math on the top of each page in a banner format. Um, and the same thing for the district. So you're going to see um, a little more um, transparency there right on the district and school home pages about the uh, percentage of students scoring proficient and distinguished in reading and math. So that'll be a pretty significant change. And I think it's really important here to note that as you're looking at that information um, for your districts in the future, um, that uh, that information 
is not going to necessarily align to the accountability system because the accountability system is not necessarily based on proficient percent of students proficient and distinguished. There's many more sort of layers and nuances to that system. And so you might have, um, you might see some ranking information on the school's homepage, but then find that your school is blue or green and you're going to think, well, why are we ranked here? But we have this other rating over here. And so it's important to know that those ratings are not related. They're found in separate legislation. There's separate rules governing them. Um, so uh, a little more transparency is always great, but it can also be a little confusing, so it's just important that we are keying into that. Um, I would like to talk to you about House Bill 142. This is um, a bill that requires local boards of education to amend their policies related to tobacco, alternative nicotine products, and vapor products within the schools. Um, so schools are now required to administer evidence-based age-appropriate prevention and cessation materials to all students at the beginning of the school year and to provide access to those materials throughout the school year. So really, anytime a student um, receives an infraction or a behavior referral for um, using a tobacco product or a vape product at school, they should also be handed cessation uh, materials materials or be given access to online cessation materials. So that's uh, sort of going to travel together from now on. Um, there are also some additional um, requirements built in around, um, not requirements, but permissive language around infractions and being able to suspend students for chronic um, tobacco and nicotine use. We at the agency are not um, very supportive of that because we don't want students to go home and be suspended. If you were suspended for vaping in the bathroom, you're going to go home and be by yourself and you're just going to keep vaping. And so that doesn't really do anything to support um, our students and their health efforts. And so we're really encouraging districts to hold on to those kids and to provide that cessation um, work within the school day, maybe in a in school suspension room, having access to those cessation materials there. I also want to draw your attention to House Bill 829. Um, this bill deals with medical cannabis. So we do have medical cannabis as an allowable um, medication in the Commonwealth now, and so we needed a little legislation to kind of govern what that looks like. And so districts will be required to um, create or amend local policies related to medical cannabis. And basically the guidance here is we want districts to treat medical cannabis the same way they would treat any other um, dangerous or controlled medication, any other narcotic medication. So if you have students who are taking clonopin, for example, that's a controlled medication that can be addictive. Um, we have procedures in place already for how we would administer something like clonopin um, to to our students during the school day. And so we would encourage folks to continue to follow those same general rules. Um, additionally, um, medical cannabis must be administered in a location where no other student can witness the administration. And so that is really a HIPAA rule um, to protect that student's privacy. Um, I see a question in the chat, but I'm gonna get through all of these and then I'll come back because I've got too many screens going here. Um, so related to curriculum and instruction, you'll see in um, House Bill 162, um, and this is all about improving our math scores. So you might remember Read to Achieve last year and how that changed how we approach the instruction of reading in the Commonwealth. This bill will be doing the same thing, but for math support. Um, it's going to look a little bit different, um, I think, from the agency perspective, because there aren't as many um, sort of packaged up um, programs, kind of like we did the letters program, <laughs> pardon me, for reading. There aren't, there's not really a letters program equivalent for math instruction. So it's going to look a little bit different, um, but you'll start to see a, a renewed focus um, on that uh, math instruction. Um, a lot more in that bill too, uh, a lot of specifics in that, so I would encourage you to look at the guidance document that I sent and really dig into some of those details um, if that's if math instruction is something that's of interest to you. Senate Bill um, 167 will also require um, a course of study in cursive writing in all elementary schools. Um, so cursive writing, you know, that's one of those things that kind of ebbs and flows, it comes and goes, right? A lot of us probably went through cursive writing training um, 
at elementary school. I feel like mine was really rigorous. I feel like we spent a lot of time doing that. Cursive writing has been in our Kentucky academic standards, so it shouldn't be brand new to our schools. Um, most schools are already teaching cursive writing in some form or structure. Um, and then let me talk about House Bill 377, which is about teacher recruitment and retention. So there's going to be two new programs. There's going to be a teacher recruitment student loan forgiveness program. And so this will be a program where you could apply for um, a, a student loan to pursue a teaching degree. And then if you enter the teaching profession at the end and you stay a teacher for a certain amount of time, you would have that loan forgiven. It, it turns into a, a forgivable grant. Um, and then we're also going to be seeing a new student teacher stipend program. So student teachers will be eligible for up to $5,000 um, for completing that student teaching. Uh, student teachers, of course, now work for free. And so um, we, we think it's pretty cool that they're going to have an opportunity to really focus on their student teaching and not have to work um, during their student teaching the way basically all, every uh, educator that I know right now had to do. So that will provide them with a better student teaching experience, hopefully a deeper one. That will be run by the um, KIA, the Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authority. And so KDE doesn't have any further details on what that will look like, um, but KIA is working on regulations related to that. Um, finally, I want to talk to you about um, House Bill 446, which is a school transportation bill, and this deals with um, student safety and behavior during transportation. And what this says, among many other things, but most relevant to um, the work you do in the Family Partnership Council, um, is that it requires districts to have new procedures for um, documenting and monitoring student behavior on the bus. Students will also now be required to sign a um, like a behavior assurance document um, to say, I understand what the expectation is on the bus. And if I'm not meeting that expectation, I understand that I can be denied transportation. It also gives a lot of um, support to our bus drivers um, who are of course the first and last faces that our kids see of our school system every day and um, gives them some support to be able to say i don't feel safe transporting this kid um, so let's move bus drivers around and give this kid a different in a different situation get the bus driver in a different situation that that should help promote everyone's safety and and relieve some uh, emotional tensions that we sometimes have it also guarantees that bus driver um, a right to be heard. Um, so if there is a behavioral hearing relating uh, or stemming from a school bus related transportation incident, that bus driver now has the right to be heard um, in those hearings. So those are, I think, sort of the, the big bills um, oh, wait, one more, sorry, one more. Senate Bill 2, um, I can't believe I almost forgot about this one. This is our School Safety and Resiliency Act, sort of 2.0. So the School Safety and Resiliency Act was passed in 2019. Um, it's been a while, of course, since we've really looked at it. And so now five years later, we're taking a look to see how do we refresh this bill. Um, this bill does create some new requirements for districts as they will be um, required to submit their trauma-informed education plans to the department so we can see what's in those, provide technical assistance around that. Um, it creates some changes around um, suicide prevention training and increasing suicide evidence-based suicide prevention training. It, it requires um, a higher number of direct service hours for our school counselors as they engage with their students. And um, it also introduces a program, a new program called the Guardians Program. And the Guardians Program will be um, managed by the Kentucky Center for School Safety and the State School Security Marshal. But basically what this program is, is it's an added, an optional added security layer that school districts can deploy, um, allowing them to hire recently retired police officers or recently honorably discharged military veterans into the schools. And those folks would be allowed to carry a weapon on school property. Um, this, like I said, is an optional program. And from the agency's perspective, we would rather have schools hire um, school resource officers um, at first and then guardians as a last resort. Um, and that's some language I think you're going to start to see being echoed by folks like the Kentucky Center for School Safety and the Marshal's Office 
Um, those SROs have a higher level of training, they have a higher level of authority, and therefore a higher level of responsibility. Um, so that really is the way we'd like to see folks go. But we know that we're in a shortage across the state of SROs. Um, and so uh, this guardians option does allow um, for more folks to be in the school to provide security, and that may be appropriate um, for folks in some instances. Okay, so that um, is the end of my list of bills that I've pulled that I think are most relevant to the Family Partnership Council. Um, I'm happy to address any questions that you have or any other bills um, that I might have missed. Matthew, thank you so much. That's quite the comprehensive list, and, and I do appreciate the guidance document there for us. Rhonda had a question. Let's circle back to Rhonda's question. Um, did the bill address not filing drug charges on the child due to smoking cigarettes and vaping? And that was in connection when we were talking about um, the vaping bill. Rhonda, did I have your question correct? Okay. So um, there's no change um, to how a school would address a charge. Um, if a student has violated the law on school property and they um, that school and district can continue to charge that student as usual. Um, it, it really deals more with what authorities the school has to um, discipline that school during the school day, that student during the school day with in-school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions, behavioral referral processes, things of that nature. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Matthew? Rhonda, did that answer your question for you? Thanks. She posted. Yes, thank you. All right, Matthew, I think we have uh, you covered it so well. Thank you so much. I, I just appreciate you taking the time. I know it's a busy day. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to come share not only the document, but really talk us through all of those that are pertinent to the Family Partnership Council. And the, there's a lot of there's a lot of new stuff to really kind of get used to and, and be aware of. So thank you so much, um, Dave. David Malanti will be speaking next to us, but I would like to say, Matthew, you're welcome to stay with us. If you're busy and you got to go, we understand, but I want to thank you again. Thank you, Marsha. <laughs> okay, your next topic requested, and this was a good one, um, about private and homeschool attendance. And I saw David is on the screen, so you're going to have an opportunity to hear from him. He is from, he is the assistant director. Um, in the Division of School and Program Improvement, and he is going to give us an update on this private and household attendance. So, David, it is all you, and I'll drive your slides. Okay, let's go on to the uh, next slide then. Thank, and thank you for being with us, and I'll monitor the chat again. Okay, okay. Again, my name is David Malanti. I'm one of the assistant directors in the Division of School and Program Improvement. Um, a request came through for a um, discussion about exemption data from compulsory attendance. So we'll talk a, a, just a little bit about those. I'm going to focus on data that is rated, related to private and homeschool attendance in the state. Um, there are other exemptions within the within the KRS that I'm going to show you that are kind of um, outside of my wheelhouse, but I can I can definitely walk you through some of the ins and outs of of the private school world. So let's go to the um, next. Yeah. So KRS one fifty nine zero three zero um, offers exemptions for um, compulsory attendance. Now I'm going to focus on um, item B or items B, C, and E within this list. But you can see there are other um, exemptions that are offered through the statute. So just to give you a little bit of background, in Kentucky, based on the uh, Constitution of Kentucky, parents are um, allowed to make the, the educational decisions that they want to for their children. That includes um, having them attend private schools, which could be a church school or some sort of non-denominational school. And it could also be in this particular state, it could be a home school. Um, <clears throat> if you were to look at surrounding states, you're going to see huge variances in the difference between what a private school is within those states. Um, in Kentucky, um, the law is 
is pretty lax on what is required of those schools. For example, um, they do not have to provide us with demographic data. They only have to, if you look in item B, they only have to, a private school or the parents have to notify the local district that children are in attendance at a private school or a home school. There are no required state assessments for private or homeschool students. So um, pretty much the homeschool or private school is required to keep attendance records, um, grade records. They are required to offer instruction in English. They're required to offer instruction in um, the core subjects, you know, reading, language, arts, math, science, social studies, those types of things. And <clears throat> their records um, are to be open for inspection by the local district pupil personnel staff or the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, however, um, they are very irregularly monitored um, for, the, for compliance with those records. So let's go to the next slide. Just to give you some idea of what private school attendance um, in this state looks like, I've given you three years worth of data <clears throat> for private school attendance, homeschool attendance, and total private homeschool attendance in the state. Um, going back to 2021, the 2021 school year. Um, I do not have 23-24 data up because we're working through some data quality issues with that. <clears throat> but you can see, um, starting back in 2021, we had about 75,000 um, students enrolled in private and home schools. And in the last couple of years, that jumped by about 22,000 students. <clears throat> so in Kentucky, we have 170 out of 171 districts that report private and home schools within their district boundaries. One district, I think that was Pineville Independent, reports zero. So we have a good um, distribution across the state of, of private homeschools. So this data right here is collected through something we call the Declaration of Participation. We do not collect demographic data. Um, the declaration is actually used to, number one, find out counts of private school um, kids within district boundaries. We use that for federal funding and districts actually collect that data <clears throat> and use that to determine which um, private schools want to participate in services um, through some of our Every Student Succeeds Act programs and through IDEA programs. So, <clears throat> um, let's Let's go to, okay, um, go back one, sorry. Wasn't, wasn't quite ready to move forward. I forgot I put some notes on my slides, so. No worries, no worries, yeah. just let me know. <laughs> so take a look at 22, 23 data, it's not on the slide. We had approximately 790,000 school age, aged children in Kentucky. Private and homeschool attendance represented about 12% of that. Um, so within that private school, within that almost 98,000 uh, student count, we had about 11% of those students who withdrew from public school. That's around 11,000 um, students. So 11,000 students out of that 86 or out of that 98,000 um, student count actually withdraw, withdrew from public school. So where do the rest of those kids come from? Well, one of two pots generally. One, they had been, have been in um, private or home school since kindergarten and never registered with a public district except to notify that, hey, we're, my kids are gonna be attending at this particular school, or they are students that have 
moved from out of state were already ready enrolled in a home or private school and continued that enrollment within the state of Kentucky. So they came in, they registered at a new private school or started a private school at home or a home school um, at home. So let's go to the next slide now. We are not required to collect <clears throat> any um, data on why families choose private or home school, but we do a lot of work with uh, stakeholders that could be districts and uh, private school representative groups. And here's what we hear most commonly. First of all, foremost um, is the desire for a religious-based education. That's, that's probably the number one reason that we hear um, for um, private, private school attendance. The second and a close second would be it's a better fit for our family or it's a better fit for my individual child or all my children. Third, which can be broken out into to kind of multiple um, sub areas is disconnect with the, pro with the public district. That could be, hey, I had a bad experience in public school when I was going through, I wanna keep my kids at home. That could be, I don't agree with some of the operational practices in a public district. Um, so I'm withdrawing them. Some people just say, hey, I don't wanna be, be involved in any way with um, the public school at all because I just don't agree with, with public education. So we hear that quite a bit um, in those three broad categories. Educational or extracurricular opportunities. Um, sometimes we hear that there are courses or um, extracurriculars such as, you know, maybe a private school offers a dance course um, as part of its physical education um, curriculum. So these are things that typically, you know, we hear this when when uh, we, we come across things that are typically not offered or cannot be offered um, by a public school district. And kind of tying into all those things is private schools, um, particularly the larger church um, schools that are run through dioceses, they do offer tuition scholarship opportunities. And that's a big draw for um, students who qualify. So again, this is anecdotal data. We don't collect that evidence anywhere. Um, it's just things that we have heard in the field as we work with stakeholders. All right, let's go to the next. So right now I'm gonna, gonna just kind of give an opportunity for discussion um, or questions or say, hey, we wanna hear some more in depth data. So what, what else could I bring to the table or what questions might you have about private school in general? Rhonda, go ahead. Rhonda's got her hand raised. We can't hear you though. Can you try? You're unmiked, unmuted, I should say. If not, she may type it in the chat for us. Sure, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. thank you. I feel like the, if you're old enough to remember the Verizon commercial, can you hear me now? Can you? <laughs> yep, yep. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I appreciate you so much sharing this. Um, one of the things that I think that would be very critical because you know, I know the reasons that you shared sort of the antidotal, but what we see throughout the state and especially over these last couple of years, the reasoning for going to it, and you're going to see, I think, a huge number when you look at from 2021 to the numbers homeschooled to 22 to 23, that huge jump is, you know, that, that many of the families they don't feel that the child's academic needs, their social, emotional, and behavioral needs have been able to be addressed. Um, and many families um, are feeling forced into, it may, not, it may not be what their first choice would be, but they are feeling forced into that decision to where 
um, based on their child's mental health and everybody, that is the best decision to make at the time. Um, and, and it concerns me greatly, and I want to make sure that we're getting the voices from all of the families, because the majority of the families, we don't have um, the means to be able to uh, to be able to do a private school, right? So families are doing the best that they can, um, and they've been placed into uh, an impossible decision um, of how we're going to get through each day. Um, and that's been huge. Um, and I would just really encourage any way that we can work together, even for the families. And I know looking at, and I appreciated you had mentioned, you know, IDEA and the, the programs through that. That's another thing that many families do not know about and we work to help is families withdrawn from school and they may have been a child uh, who had an IEP, but no one tells them when they go to remove them to private or homeschool that they have a right to a private school plan. So there's a huge disconnect that they could be leading with services and support and not realize they could still get that in other means. Um, and that would only help the child be successful. So I think us working together on that and then accessing those programs would greatly help. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point in this state. <clears throat> outside of what might be offered through um, federal program services, there is no additional support. So you do not get, for example, a um, a waiver at this point. I know that's coming on, on the ballot in November to be able to use funds for um, sort of, of um, gosh, what do I want to call them? basically giving giving family support to attend the private school but um, currently there is no support outside of the really the services that they might qualify under certain federal programs and those are services not not funds that they're receiving so that could be things such as um things related to to student learning needs it could be professional development it could be um, things on the on on the IDEA side, but other than that, you know, in this particular state, <clears throat> there, there's a, a kind of a, a void between the services you can get in the public district and your responsibilities um, if you're doing homeschool or private school. So Thanks for that clarification. And I, since we were talking data, I popped back to that slide, but I'll go back to your contact information. Um, Rhonda, thank you for that that question and, and that discussion. And so it, are there any other questions while we have David with us around this topic? All right, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Appreciate you're welcome. Your time and preparing these slides. It was very yeah, helpful welcome. information. Um, okay, our next uh, requested topic, um, and David, you're welcome to stay with us, um, or if you need to hop off, we understand, but, but thank you again. Um, our next topic was around chronic absenteeism, and I know we had a very, very healthy discussion um, around this topic last month, and so we're going to delve a little deeper, but I'm not sure that Florence Chang or Judy are with us yet. Leslie, can you help me look, please, or Emily? Um, they were in a, a meeting that bumped right into this one, and so if they're not here with us yet, oh, I'm looking, not, yeah, okay, they're not. I don't see them here, no, not yet. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do in the interest of time is I'm going to pop on down and start my presentation and we'll go through that. And then when we see them and, and I kind of wrap up with your questions and discussion around the update, we'll come back to them. So let's move on. And I'm going to try to move some slides without making us all dizzy. So I apologize in the meantime. And that they have a, a really good presentation for us later on. Okay, so here's my portion today. Um, I would like to give you an update on the Family Partnership Council's recommendations to the Kentucky Department of Ed. And so, I, do I hear you? Someone's. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, I just want to give you an update on the progress that we've made on that report that this group uh, worked on before. And again, there is my information. Um, if you're looking for me, I do have my email address in here at the end. And again, I just want to review the purpose of this council. I know we went over it at the beginning, but the council serves in an advisory role to the Kentucky Department of Ed, which we call KDE, and provides input regarding topics of interest to families, such as ways that families and communities can assist schools in ensuring that the achievement level of all students is increased. So with that in mind, let's just review our history of the Family Partnership Council recommendations. So those members who served in the 21-23 Council were charged by our form, the former chairperson, which was Brooke Gill, to compile a report about the progress that Kentucky has made in honoring the recommendations set forth by the previous Commissioners, Parents, Advisory Council, or CPAC in 2007 to present. And so if you just remember, the actual council name was changed in 2021 to Family Partnership Council to more accurately reflect that family dynamic because it, it, it is all encompassing of roles that are serving um, in that role as the parent. And so this report addressed whether Kentucky made progress on these previous recommendations and established some next steps for us, the current FBC members, to see through. And so recommendation one, and what I'm going to do today is just kind of go through those four recommendations and what's been done in those areas. If you do not have a full copy of that report, it is posted on the Family Partnership Council webpage. I see heads nodding. Most of you have it. I know it's been emailed and it's available there. So the first recommendation set forth was to encourage districts, encourage districts and schools to develop local web pages that include more robust relationship building and communication metrics regarding meaningful family and community engagement. And so under those, under that recommendation, we had to utilize the four C's, which are the connection, cognition, confidence, and capacity for policy and program goals from the dual capacity building framework as a base for those questions. And then KDE's full service community schools manager, which is the role that I serve in, highlights schools doing family partnerships well and what they are doing with a special focus on innovative practices that reach historically marginalized families. So that was the recommendation. So let me give you a little progress update on where we are. So KDE is in the process of creating an electronic questionnaire to gather promising and innovative engagement practices from districts and schools statewide. So thank you, Rhonda, for posting that the link to the report in case someone would like to print that out. I kind of keep mine handy. And then secondly, the success stories will be highlighted via a KDE webpage so that all of Kentucky's schools, districts can learn from their peers on what is really working for them to engage family and school family, sorry. So the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through a draft collection tool that we are in the process at KDE of finalizing. So I appreciate your, your thoughtful attention to these questions as I go through them. And I just want to give you a heads up because at the end, I'm going to ask you for your input and your feedback before we have a final draft. It's just really important as we move forward that, that you all have a chance to get your eyes on this before it goes out live. So the questionnaire draft, um, this is just the draft questions that we have. I'm going to show you the actual slides in just a minute of, of what it might, of what it is going to look like. I took the screenshot from the form, but the question is, tell us about a promising or innovative practice that you have implemented at your school or district to increase community or family engagement. And then it begins to drill down. How has this promising or innovative practice positively impacted outcomes for students? So that's the question centered around students outcomes. And then the third question, um, how has this promising or innovative practice positively impacted outcomes for families? So we move to that level. And then finally, how has the community become more involved because of this practice? So those are the four core questions that we'd like to gain 
um, their answers of things that are working really well. So let me show you a draft of the collection tool. And I know you can't read it, um, probably not. I was prepared for this. I actually printed out um, those slides to read to you in case it looked like this. So you can probably see a little better than I can. I've got a lot going on <laughs> on my screen. Um, so this is the beginning of the tool. And we're using uh, Microsoft Forms just to let you know what this will be in. So during, do you all need me to read this? You can't read it? Laura, can you see it? I can see it. I can read it on mine. I mean, I don't okay. know. I, like I said, I've got a lot going on, on my screen, so you all probably have a better, um, a much better view of it. But basically, it just outlines the purpose of the Family Partnership Council um, and what the intent and kind of the history around why we are asking these things. It goes on to talk about the four recommendations that we are going to go through today that this group put together with Brooke Gill. And then the following questions at the bottom, it simply says, the following questions are designed for your school or district to tell its story about successful partnership practices that are making a positive impact for students and families in your school district and or community. Practices that are mutually beneficial to others throughout the state will be showcased on KDE's website as a hub for others to learn from and will be highlighted during family partnership council meetings. So it just asks, please take a moment to complete the reflection questions below to help us better understand what your school or district is doing to successfully engage its families. And then it just has my contact information. So let me show you what it will actually look like. And again, this is a draft. If there is a red asterisk, it just denotes that that question is required before you move through the tool. So we're looking for um, the district name the school name, and then the first question, which I've, I've read already, um, talk about a, tell us about a promising or innovative practice you have implemented at your school or within the district, because it could be district personnel filling this out um, to increase community and family engagement. So that's what the first three questions would look like. And the space provided, and those are text boxes so that, I'm, I'm sure there's a limit on characters, but we've tried to make sure that there's plenty of room there if someone wants to really elaborate on that practice. And then when we move into um, the next portion, and again, I just did some screenshots to fit on these slides. That fourth question is the one about students. How has this promising or innovative practice positively impacted outcomes for students and then a space for their answer? And then the fifth question on the questionnaire, um, how has this promising or innovative practice positively impacted outcomes for families? And then that final question there is how has the community become more involved because of this practice? So those are those questions, those are all required. And then there is an optional question um, that we'd like some input on, but please use this space to share any additional information or comments. We thought it might be great if they really wanted to expand or whatever they wanted to share with us as a group. So that is the draft. Um, so feedback, it's your turn. Uh, what questions or comments do you have about the form or the questions? I don't really have any questions, but I do think I like it. I like that they're open ended and it allows them to really tell their story. And so I think that's important that every district kind of has their own story to tell about how they're engaging families and then we can learn from each other, like you said. So I think I like it. Thank you, because that really was the goal to make it open ended and not really put a, a, a constricting space there for them to answer. Um, I think it's I. I'm hopeful you know, that we hear. And so part of your role too is when this goes live, we will let you know that it is going live. Um, we'll email you when it does and just then you can encourage, you know, the entities that you come in contact with to fill this out and send this in so that we can begin to build a really strong, hefty database of things that are going on and share those so that everyone can see. So thank you. Thank you for that. 
Um, any other input or question? Hi, Marcia. It's Laura. Um, hey, Laura. I think it looks. I think it looks great. Uh, the question I do have around um, filling it out would be if you have, um, for instance, like somebody from our community schools cohort, mm -hmm. um, maybe a business person or a community member who sees something happening or a parent leader. Um, the question would be, um, is it dis just district staff that fill this out or could it be anyone? Um, and if it's anyone, would they know that they're able to fill it out based on, and I didn't get a chance to like, dig deep into the first slide um, that had the, the narrative on it, but um, yeah, that would be my question. Yeah. So, and that's a great question. And I know actually um, Brooke and I talked, she had asked that question too. The, the intent and the audience for this particular tool will be districts and schools so that we can get those practices. I do think there's space and place for us to have a conversation about how do we share that out with community members that are involved um maybe in ways and so certainly you made me think a really good question although they will identify themselves if we have a kcsi school um fill this out will we know that but i think internally you know i'm going to know that when we draft it it might even be helpful but i don't want to confuse anyone if they're saying they're in kcsi because okay ron just agreeing with me because that may be like hey we're doing stuff but i don't know and how do i get in so rhonda did that answer you, Laura? It did. Yeah, thank okay. you. Rhonda? Well, I was hands. just going to say um, one of the things, uh, a possible addition that I think would be very critical in the get go here is wanting to know is was your promising or innovative practices uh, developed in partnership with families? And if so, what part does the families play in it? And also, did those families represent uh, a diverse group that is representative of your family? That's a good suggestion. Like, how did they get that policy there? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to write this down, and then we can process and, and reflect th through that. And then back to what Laura said, that might even be, uh, you know, phase two of this tool to include those folks. So. We'll let us let us work through that too. But thank you. That's really good. So if you if you don't mind, let me just make sure I have your question. Was your promising practice developed with families? With families and with diverse groups of your population? Do I have it right? Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's even better, Rhonda. I'll grab it right out of the chat. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to trust my notes on this one. OK, those are great, great comments and suggestions. Anything else? Hello, this is Tara Trucor. Um, I just hey, had a Tara. question. I think these are hi. I think these are really great questions as well. Um, I work with the Head Start program um, with OVAC and we are within uh, many school districts. And I was wondering how that would work for us or how that how we would communicate that out. I don't know. I just think they're really great and I think it would be a good opportunity um, too. So I would hope and, and I made a note to make sure Head Start is included because once this goes live and we send out information, it is live. My question back to you is would that capture if those Head Starts in those districts, would they get that as well? So that might be something we'd have to work around a little bit. Um, the the sharing out, like I said, we'll keep a database and then we'll begin to share those stories um, on on KDE's uh, website in some fashion. We've talked about putting them on my on my web page for that full. It's not mine, but but my section that I work on at the KDE with the full service community schools page, which we link out directly with. Uh, Pritchard Committee in the case, the Kentucky Community School Initiative that I spoke about last time and that Laura and I work on together among other projects, right, Laura? <laughs> and then, um, so that that's great because we also want those early childhood best practices. I know Laura and I were just at the Groundswell Summit last week and 
while I was there, I had an opportunity to visit um, and hear about a lot of the early childhood work that was going on there in Owensboro in the community and at the YMCA on, on the bus tour that we did. And so that was very interesting to see how those practices that for getting kids kindergarten ready and just with a focus on zero to three. And so that was, you know, there's lots of good work going on out there. So that's a great suggestion. How do we make sure we capture early childhood and Head Start? Anything else? All right. Thank you all. I appreciate those. Those were great um, additions to the thing. So we'll circle back and work on that a little bit um, more. And so let me move right on to our second recommendation. And I'm going back to that Family Partnership Council uh, uh, recommendation document. So the second recommendation was KDE hires a full service, full time, full service community schools. That's a mouthful. So FSCS manager, which is fully funded by the Pritchard Committee through 2007. And so, um, as you know, I am serving in that role um, and was filled in September 1. I started September 1 in this role of 2023. So the work in progress, I just updated you on recommendation one on highlighting schools doing family partnerships well. We're also, my role is supporting ongoing trainings for family engagement strategies with state, district, school, and family engagement coordinators. So that's about FRISC, that's about our state coaches, that is about all of the things that go on um, within connecting work within KDE with these initiatives and with family partnership work. So recommendation three. Um, in 2024, the Family Partnership Council will make recommendations to the local educational agencies and other state organizations on one or more tools that support families in navigating their educational options. That's a mouthful right now and rights within Kentucky's educational system. So in 2025, the FPC will partner with KDE and other organizations to create an online age index family friendly guide that shares the most effective ways for schools to partner with families. So let me give you an update on this. Um, I've already participated in some initial conversations on creating a one stop web page to assist families in navigating all of their educational options and rights within Kentucky's educational system. Um, including the school based decision making information. So those SBDM council, those updates, English learner, which we call EL resources um, to those families. We know we have a very growing population in that segment. Legislative updates like we heard from Matthew today and Brian Perry last month and to provide information that will enable families to become more actively engaged and effective in supporting student success. So I know that sounds like a lot. So just so that we know we are, even though it says that's in 2025, we are already at work at what that might look like, how that might live so that it's live and the resources that are needed um, that families might need to find without having to dig through, you know, a, a pretty hefty website. So recommendation four is the FPC's work in 2024 through 2026 is to assist the implementation of the three previous goals and most importantly support many more schools adoption of the Kentucky Family and School Partnership Guide. So you can see this really is kind of all coming. It seems to be we're, we're working in all four recommendation areas to try to get things moving. So here's a summary just of the overall progress. Recommendation one and three that I just reviewed are in the initial stages of conversation and or development. Recommendation two has been implemented, implemented, I'm sorry, and the work ongoing. Uh, Family Partnership Council members input and role. So I spoke to this earlier. Your role as an FPC member is to promote and encourage use of success story tool as an avenue of statewide sharing of success stories. And then KDE FSCS manager supports ongoing training for engagement coordinators. I kind of alluded to this a minute ago. That's working with Frisk, working with the Kentucky Community Schools Initiative, that KCSI that I've spoken to, 
on available KDE resources, um, the effective family partnership strategies, improved relationship building and communication, and then comprehensive improvement planning. And I, I call myself often a dot connector. So I'm trying to, like the dots from that work, I try to bring back in and the things within KDE, I try to bring back out um, so that we really have a, a wider sharing network and, and can really begin to work together so that we can have some better outcomes for our students and families. All right, that is my contact information. I think you all have my email address um, on our emails. Um, but certainly if you have a thought or you just want to process through some of this today um, and you have another question, don't hesitate to send an email or ask a question and we'll, we'll, um, I'll do my best to get back to you. Maybe it's a conversation we need to have or let me think through that and I'll get you an answer. And so any questions about the update or the progress summary, anything that you have about that I may have already shared? All right, I think we're good. And I think I think our chronic absenteeism folks are on board. Are they not, Leslie? Yes, they're with us. That's what I thought. I thought I saw them pop in. So let me without I'm oh, sorry. Oh no, I'm making folks dizzy here. Um let's go back to their section and I will introduce them. Um hey. Florence and Judy, thank you so much for being with us. And they're going to talk to us about chronic absenteeism. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. Um, sounds good. So, yes. um, I, so my name is Florence Chang, and I think I've met you all and I was here last time in March. So um, I'm a consultant in the Division of Student Success. And Judy, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. I'm Judy Sanderhar and I work uh, also with Florence in the Division of Student Success. Okay, great. Awesome. So um, you'll remember last time we talked a little bit about um, kind of what's been going on with chronic absenteeism. It's a rising issue with um, our students in Kentucky and it continues to be a issue that we need families, um, family engagement as one of our primary um, strategies is to have families involved in this. So that's why we wanted to come back to you today, give you a couple updates. Um, number one, we have a lot more data to share, um, to kind of get your thoughts on, and then to share some uh, thinking about what are some other strategies that we could be implementing over the summer and next year. So next slide, and I don't know if I can, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I can drive them, just let me know if I don't, thanks. if I miss the queue. <laughs> okay, thanks, Marcia. Uh, okay, so this slide is demonstrating um, the severity of how much chronic absenteeism has actually changed pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So you'll see here on the left side um, is 2017-18 data. Uh, showing which counties in Kentucky had at least 20% chronically absent. And 20% is important because that is the kind of national definition of a crisis. When you see you have at least 20% of your kids absent in school, it's deemed as a problem, a, a high problem. And so 20% um, and you'll see on the left was primarily in Eastern Kentucky um, pre-pandemic, uh, probably associated with things like uh, the economic resources in that area um, and, and lack of resources really in some of those areas as coupled with um, just uh, lower education levels and things like that could be contributing to why we saw that pre-pandemic. Now, post-pandemic, you'll see on the right, uh, now almost every county in Kentucky has reached that extreme um, or highly extreme um, chronic absenteeism level. And the darker blue shades actually indicate that uh, the higher the chronic absenteeism rate. So now you'll see like Eastern Kentucky is showing many districts with over 40, 50, 60% of their kids are chronically absent. So um, it is a very um, heightened problem 
in Eastern Kentucky still. Um, okay, next slide. Thanks for that. That's an interesting graphic. Thank you. Yeah, it's really startling. Mm -hmm. And I should um, give credit to our Office of the Commissioner, Leslie McKinney, put these together for us. So she's awesome. Uh, okay, so so that's one of our key takeaways, like from our data analysis, is that we have geographical differences in chronic absenteeism. This slide is actually showing us we have uh, age differences in what's happening with chronic absenteeism. So across the bottom, you'll see the grade levels, kindergarten through 12th grade, and you'll see um, in the dark blue line is what was the chronic absenteeism for that grade level before the pandemic? So for example, um, in kindergarten before the pandemic, it was at 16% for that grade. Um, the green line is now showing where they are in the most recent data, which is 22, 23. Um, and what is their chronic absenteeism level now after the pandemic? And the red numbers show the percent increase. So you will see Number one, we still see pretty high chronic absenteeism rates at the high school level. So that's always been kind of an issue um, that Kentucky has had to, to work with is that you see 12th grade, you know, a third were chronically absent and now it's 40%. So that continues to be a very um, high level of concern for KDEs at high school level. But now what we're seeing is this enormous increase and a disproportional increase at the younger level. So kindergarten, first, second grade has almost doubled. It has doubled actually in their chronic absenteeism rates. So now instead of 16%, you're seeing a third of kindergartners at grade one, it went from 13 to 26 and so on. And these are, that's a huge concern because what we know from historical data is attendance habits start early. So when kids are absent in kindergarten, they're also likely the same kids absent in first grade and the same kids absent in second grade, and that continues. And now we have so many kids absent at those younger grades, they are missing those foundational skills in literacy, numeracy, and so on. And to a point where I explained to a parent um, this semester that remember if your kid is missing 30, 30 days of kindergarten, it's only two or three days a month. It doesn't feel like that much when you're actually in the in the deep, you know, throes of school. Two or three days doesn't feel like a lot that you're missing. But if you're missing that every year, every month, by fifth grade, you've missed a year of school. So it is a huge concern to see those younger kids are missing school at such a high rate. Okay, next slide. So we're disproportional by geography, we're disproportional by grade, and the and this slide shows how different we are by the different student groups. So um, you'll see the blue chart shows pre-pandemic, the green post-pandemic, and again, huge increases across the board, even among gifted and talented, which is a group that doesn't get mentioned very much when you talk about risk, mm -hmm. but this pandemic impacted all student groups every race, every um, student group that you can think of. This just highlights a few of those groups, but now you'll see you'll see one out of five of our gifted and talented group, gifted and talented kids are, are chronically absent all the way to our homeless population where we're seeing half of them are identifying or are, are, are exhibiting chronic absenteeism rates. Um, so again, just a reminder, chronic absenteeism is defined as you're missing at least 10% of school. So typically about two days a month. Uh, but this is across the board, a, a large concern. And most of these groups on this slide are groups of kids that are already um, significantly lower in academic achievement. Um, so when we talk about their learning, they actually need to be in school as much as possible as they're already um, showing disproportional rates when you look at the um, summative testing. Okay, so Judy's going to start talking about what's going on at the school level. Yeah. So um, looking at, you know, outside of the individual student groups, when we think about whole schools and the impact of this what's happening at the at the school level it's pretty huge and basically i think in and just summarizing 
Right now, so before the pandemic, 5% of our students were attending a school that is considered high or extremely high uh, chronic absenteeism, and that's the range between 20 and then over 30%. Post-pandemic, 75% of Kentucky students are attending schools with this high to extreme level of absenteeism. And thinking about what does that mean at the school level? Um, for um, the experience that kids and adults have in schools. So you have, um, you know, more, so you, we already have kind of a struggle with um, the level of need uh, that students um, have around even just basic needs, mental health needs, versus the capacity uh, to actually meet all of those needs, particularly in schools that are, um, where you have a large concentration of students in poverty, a large concentration of that need, you already have adults who are struggling uh, to meet those needs. So thinking about also for instruction and Leslie uh, McKinney, who uh, did the data slides, you know, really pointed out something I thought was interesting in that in the classroom, what does this mean uh, when you have so many students who are missing uh, missing uh, in and out, you have to start your instruction over. Um, so what does it mean for the students who are there? Um, you know, so just thinking about the impact again at that level. And and again, of course, everyone on here knows this is what we're talking about, attendance and chronic absenteeism as the problem. And it is the problem. But actually, more than the problem, it is just a symptom of many problems that we have uh, going on and clearly in our communities, our society, um, and also within schools. Uh, we also have a teacher, you know, there's some issues with teacher attendance. Um, and again, that's a symptom of bigger problems that uh, we should be addressing, which again, nobody, everyone on this call is acutely aware of, I'm sure. Uh, okay, next slide. Let's there we go. Okay. And also in her analysis, she looked at, so when students drop out, and unfortunately our dropout rate has also doubled over this past year, um, which again, I don't think any of this is surprising. That's another symptom. Um, so in Kentucky, there is, a schools have the ability, uh, if they have access to the student who before they dropped out or after, to, to note the reason that they dropped out. Now, um, it's not required, but uh, for, for a, a portion of students, this data exists. So she looked at students who are chronically absent that did drop out to ascertain the reasons that they noted. And I think it's very interesting that the top four reasons um, that were identified by students themselves were feeling bored or because we know dropouts a process of disengagement, but they were feeling bored. So we also hear a lot of things from students about kind of the overuse of Chromebooks. So they're kind of doing virtual learning in class, which again, when you have schools, whole schools where so many schools where students are in and out, it's probably a little bit easier for teachers to use maybe, you know, those kind of platforms and some virtual learning to deal with that problem, you know, so kids can work at their own pace. So, um, yeah. Um, also employment, uh, kids having to put food on their family's table, um, failing classes and they can't catch up uh, and problems uh, they're noting with family. And this also, these categories track with when we look at the reasons kids are leaving school, it falls into three categories and about half of them. So the categories are pushed out and pushed out means like suspensions, like um, they can't catch up because they've missed too much. So that's actually considered a push out. And then being pulled out is something like they need to work to survive and help their family survive. And then feeling uh, uh, falling out. So pushed out, pulled out, and fell out. Uh, and falling out is that process of disengagement. They don't feel like they're welcome. They don't feel supported at school. So this all tracks with that. But um, 
I think these are um, important things to note. Uh, and again, probably not surprising to anyone here. And then the last slide uh, we were just going to share. Um, Florence was able to engage with the Student Advisory uh, Council with another one of our colleagues around the issue of improving attendance because um, as you all well know, and I know the Pritchard Committee does an amazing job with youth uh, voice. Um, and in fact, we just uh, were on a call today with Attendance Works. And they said there's a national organization called Youth Truth, and some of you may know about them. But they are going to release some data in the fall where they uh, surveyed young people about why they're not coming to school or why they didn't. And the number one reason was mental health. They're dealing with anxiety, depression, and that kind of thing. So, you know, again, none of this is surprising, but I think how we can continue to engage uh, young people's voice is so critical. And so these were just some of the suggestions that um, the students on the council kind of were recommending. So messaging campaigns, which uh, we are launching one at the state level. Uh, this summer, uh, it will it'll be launched this fall, but we're, we're getting ready this summer. Um, it's in the works now. Um, again, use of technology that is engaging versus disengaging. Because um, I think, I mean, if obviously for any of us, if we could, you know, go to school and, and do the work and get our grades the same way we could do that at home versus be in school. I, and you're not engaged in any extracurriculars, it's, and you're dealing with anxiety or bullying, <laughs> you know, I mean, the common sense choice is doing it at school, at, at home, so not coming into the seat in school. Um, and then family engagement, which I know that's what uh, we're talking about here. Um, intentional scheduling that promotes engagement. And then again, very important, the peer-led initiatives and peer support. Um, I know that peer-led campaigns, and they're doing a lot of that work um, in other areas around substance use, because we're seeing huge increases in substance use, which is connected with mental health. Uh, that's kind of how a lot of kids are coping, and then it makes it the mental health issues worse. But having, you know, students are going to listen to other students more than they are going to listen to us. So. Um, having student-led campaigns, and I'm sure a lot of you all know the Sources of Strength uh, initiative is we do a lot of training on that, and it's in a lot of Kentucky schools. It's my probably my favorite thing to train on uh, because the youth are so creative, and, you know, that's what they do. They come up with campaigns inside their school. It's a network situation where you have different – each students that represent all the different groups, you know, it's about their influence uh, with their peers around um, help, hope, and strength, not the trauma, not, you know, we have to deal with that, but what can we do when we're, when we're struggling? So help, hope, and strength. So um, that is kind of the slides uh, and the information that we um, wanted to share with you all and just get any, um, insight that you all have around um, the content we shared and also as I mentioned KDE is launching an attendance awareness campaign we've never done that at the state level and several other states have done some great campaigns and what we were having a conversation about is around you know what would be effective messaging and effective dissemination of messaging for families because um, around attendance. Rhonda, go okay. ahead. Yep, Rhonda has a question. So, well, several well, so much. Um, one of the things, you know, especially when we're looking at, um, and I'll, I'll tell you as a mom who experienced this, when my son said to me, um, I have went two years and I have learned nothing. Uh, this is an AP student. He's broader. There's no telling what his IQ is. I mean, I know I sound like a bragging mom, but, you know, but there's there's the emotional things that tie into, and it's almost as we're having them do busy work. Um, and how do I justify that to them? Because this is a child that I cannot thrive on academics. 
And when we have removed those academics, that is to many others who may be an athlete, that's just like not being able to play on the team. Um, and how can we ask them to continually come to the table um, when when that's occurring? You know, and looking at, especially with, um, and I appreciate the data and the sharing, when you look at the numbers and you've got 36% of the students are students with disabilities and only 16.5% of the overall population is students with disabilities. We've got big problems. Um, and, and how do we work together? Because working with families, um, families are running into barriers as just as our students are, that everybody is looking at it um, and being antidotal. Well, that's just because that's a bad kid. That's a bad parent. And we're trying, you know, and I don't think anybody intentionally is trying to put walls up, but I think everybody's at a point where they're not having their mental health uh, addressed. And I'm talking about the administration, the teachers, everybody, that um, families are running into nonstop barriers, trying to advocate for their child, trying to access services so it doesn't get to where they have withdrew them from school, they've dropped out, they decided to homeschool because either academic, social, emotional, um, or behavioral needs are not being met. Um, we're putting families and in, in our students into impossible situations just as our staff within the schools are. And I don't think there's not going to be one nice thing that's going to solve it, but we just need people that are willing uh, and see that we're trying to help. We're not trying to say you did it all, but as families, we need to realize we are all playing a part in it and help us fix it because we're getting doors slammed where we're not getting those opportunities. Thank I'll just you, say I, I definitely hear you and appreciate you sharing that. Um, and there is definitely some data to that tracks with what you're saying around adults in schools. There's uh, the Impact Working Conditions Survey. I'm sure you all are familiar with that, but still the lowest item is well-being, emotional well-being. So, yeah, the mental health and well-being of, of adults matters so much because when you feel better, you have more, you're better able to communicate and have good relations under stress because it's incredibly stressful in these, in schools because so, but yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that um, around the barriers and where it feels nonstop. I know we get phone calls in our office and feel them from around situations that are quite disturbing. Um, so, um, thank you, thank you for that. And then. I really did the like some words res and I'm coming to you. <laughs> I'm coming to your question. I see your hand. Like it really resonated. Like sometimes schools are putting families in impossible or improbable situations. And so I know with the work that that we're kind of doing over in the community school initiative, and Lauren might want to speak to this in just a minute after we get to Elizabeth's question. Um, you know, just really trying to remove, identify, and then remove barriers. And so. You know, we might think it's a barrier, but it we need to hear from those families. So back to what you said earlier, you know, have families had input into something there as well? Because we we can't possibly know all of the answers um, of of what you know of what a barrier is to those families. Elizabeth, do you go by Ashley or Elizabeth? I'm sorry, I've forgotten. That's okay. I go by Ashley, but you can I, call me either one. I promise I will answer. I, I thought, I said, I think she goes by Ashley. Ashley, you've got your hand up, go ahead. I do. My question was um, whether you all had access to um, compare the data on student truancy um, numbers versus chronic absenteeism numbers, because I'm assuming with chronic absenteeism, you all are just talking about absences in general. They may all be excused absences, um, you know, in some, some of these cases, but I'm wondering if there has also been an uptick in truancy cases statewide 
I have not seen that personally where I live. I've actually seen a decrease since COVID. So I'm kind of interested to see how those numbers on just the, the truancy enforcement part look when compared to the chronic absenteeism numbers. Oh, Judy, go ahead, Judy. Uh, I actually do not have the data on the truancy. I don't know if Florence does, but I can tell you, um, I am my assumption from the anecdotally what I'm hearing from other uh, groups is that that's also up. And one of the biggest challenges that, at least from my perspective, again, I talked about fielding some calls around this particular issue. Unfortunately, um, uh, there's, you know, let's see, <laughs> there's been the use of, I think there's maybe, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the threat of court and the threat of being removed from home and the, the threat of going to court for education neglect is unfortunately something that is being used. Um, and there is, there are in some places in our state, they're so backlogged uh, because of the number of kids who have been um, and families who have been sent to court over this issue of attendance. It is definitely an issue. Um, and we all know that taking the punitive approach is not is not helpful and can be very, very disruptive. And at the same time, what we hear from some of the people in those positions who do that is that in some cases, it is the only way to get a situation dealt with where a, a, a young person is actually at risk and the system will not remove them. Um, from the home they're not safe in. So, I mean, I, you know, we hear a multiple sides of it, but, but that is one thing that is, I think a big challenge, you know, there's other systems involved. Um, and there was recent legislation passed, I guess, I don't know if it's your, uh, that it requires starting this school year, um, students or families being referred to the county attorney after 15 unexcused absences. So we're going to see even more, I think. I don't know, Florence, do you have any? Christina about? wants to answer. Yeah, Christina wants to answer. So Christina, go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Christina Weeder. I'm the director of the Division of Student Success. And um, Judy and Florence have done a, a wonderful job, I think, uh, sharing this information and responding to your questions. And I just wanted to jump in because I, I do a lot of work, um, interagency work with the juvenile justice system, with the administrative office of the courts and, and had some, you know, side conversations with them uh, where they have, you know, shared administrative office of the courts in particular has shared some of their data about all the different counties and how many absences there are, but before they actually refer them to the court system. And in some, I, I would say there may be a delay in referring them to the courts based on what they have shared with me. Um, but that doesn't mean that the actual truancies are not higher um, than they, they were pre-pandemic. But I think what we're also seeing is that there are a lot of other very disruptive, sometimes uh, violent behaviors at school that are getting more of those court referrals. Um, but as, as Judy mentioned, there is some legislation that will require districts to send all of those, um, all of those, those names of students with, un, you know, 15 or more unexcused absences to the county attorney, which is really going to create some challenges, I think, for them to manage that, that number of new referrals. Um, there was, you know, one of our larger districts mentioned that it's, you know, thousands of students that are, that if the law were going, were into going into effect this year, um, based on their data that they have from this past school year, that there would be thousands of students that would be referred to their county attorney. And it's unlikely that the county attorney has the capacity to, to deal with that. And so I think what, what's most important to emphasize is that this is a 
a complex problem that will require multifaceted solutions. Um, so that's all I can share about that. Thank you so much for jumping in and adding to what Florence and Judy have shared. And that was a great question, Ashley. Anyone else have something? Um, Rhonda posted a, a comment. Nonviolent charges have increased greatly. They're not GFs and Ts. Anyone else have any thoughts or questions around the truancy while we have Christina with us or chronic absenteeism while we have Jennifer and Florence? Marsha, um, this yes. is Laura. I was just going to ask, um, the Youth Truth Survey was mentioned. Um, is mm -hmm. anyone collecting information from the family's perspective? So we're gathering from the youth perspective, but many people um, share they would want to know what the barriers are for, for families. And I was just checking to, know, to see if you know of anyone that might be collecting that survey. I'd not off the top of my head. I don't, but we can certainly look into that. Um, Christina, are you aware of any? I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the first part of the question? Which survey are you referring to? Sure. Um, someone mentioned that the Youth Truth Organization um, has will be releasing um, results from a youth survey around chronic absenteeism in the fall. And I was just curious, um, because many of us expressed wanting to know what the barriers are for families, if anyone was collecting that type of information from families that we know of. Um, I'm not familiar with, with that survey specifically or specific efforts within Kentucky to collect that. Um, I know that there are some regional interagency councils that have been working on this issue for a while, and they may be doing that more at the local level or the regional level where they're trying to kind of get that input from from families. But we we just had a great conversation earlier this morning with uh, someone from Attendance Works about how important it is to get that um, that family perspective about what their actual barriers are. Um, and so I think that's something that we want to incorporate into our um, our approach moving forward is to hear from all of the stakeholders the you know, the parents, the students, mm -hmm. the school staff um, and, and all of the people that are impacted, because what we've really come to understand is that this is a community wide issue. It's not just a student issue or a parent issue or even a school issue. It's, it's everybody. Um, that will need to be engaged to work together to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Amy, she has her hand up. Hi, yes, I just wanted to say um, you had mentioned, I see her about you know emphasizing the importance of attending school through a messaging campaign. And I feel like something that I hear commonly um, in our district when talking with other parents is that they kind of have had a priority shift in a post pandemic world to where they felt like for a while they couldn't really do freely what they wanted to do and travel or experience and do different things. And so, uh, you know, right now they kind of feel like those things are more important than whatever their kid is doing at school a lot of the time they'll brush it off that it's elementary school we can you know worry about this later we would like to do some fun things and and uh make some memories with our family so i think the importance of the messaging campaign would be vital to you know getting the message across that sure we went through this experience of the pandemic and it changed all of us but you know there are things that we need to focus on to help our children better succeed Thank you, Amy. Uh, that's a great point that you added to that list. It's uh, and, it, and it goes back to, you know, uh, raising the importance of attending school. I think it was Florence that said, and it may have been Judy, but Florence said, you know, you miss two days a month. It doesn't seem very much, but you add that up and you're going to miss an entire school year. And and you know what, Florence, I had not thought of adding all of that up. And, and that's very impactful in in so that messaging of of just the importance of a regular consistent school attendance is vital i mean you're going to have those one-offs when a child gets hurt and you know there's medical intervention that's needed and and different things but just as a regular family practice i think that could really help um in, in making 
decisions and sometimes those decisions and those vacations, you know, for once in a lifetime things, but it's just as a, a common practice. I think it's really important to emphasize the, the attendance. I agree with you on that. Anyone else? I'll, I'll just chime in really quick and just say to um, validate Amy's uh, statement about the ed other the educational opportunity like trips. I know Leslie looked at that data and it was there was a huge increase actually in absences due to those um, uh, tra that travel with families and kids. I forget the acronym. It's like educational opportunity something. I don't know, but yeah. That's that's all I remember of it too, but I know what you're talking about. That's interesting. Very interesting. All right. As always, you all have great conversation in, in Florence and Judy and Christina, the chronic absenteeism, those discussions have been so uh, lively and important each time we've met and talked about them because it is so complex, like you said, and it is so deep and and you you know we learn something and it it begs another question and so I, I just think that speaks well to everyone at least trying to put their heads and hearts around trying to solve it and make it better for our for our families and our students so is there anything else um let me jump on and see what your last slide was this is sorry i was going to pass this this is the contact information for judy and for florence and i know florence was with us last month as well and Excellent ladies, excellent information. And so here's their contact information if you have any other questions for them. And if not, I'm gonna slide back over because we did do my presentation already, sorry. Try to make it fast, get it over with. All right, again, I shared my contact information. Um, this is our last opportunity to talk about any last minute burning questions that anyone may have on any of these topics or if it prompted a thought. And I'll give you a minute to think about that. Is there anything left unasked or unsaid today that, that you want to say before we sign off? All right. I uh, just want to remind everyone our next meeting is September the 24th. And I can't believe we're talking about September already, um, September the 24th. So at this time, I'd like to call for a motion to adjourn. I see a raised hand. That was Rhonda. Rhonda made a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Tara. Thank you, Tara. All in favor? And anyone opposed? Thank you all. And again, I, a big thank you to Christina and Judy and Florence. And I know our other presenters, we want to thank them again as well. They've already left us. This was really, really um, insightful and, and really helpful. I appreciate all of your comments that you gave me on our uh, data collect on our collection tool for innovative strategies. We'll go back to work at that. And everyone have a wonderful um, rest of the week. And I won't see you for 4th of July. So everyone enjoy.